tell me about the cough. Oh, I developed this cough. It was in nineteen ninety six. I developed the cough from uh, the blue. I don't know what it was all about. I just developed the cough, and I kept going to my GP to try and sort out this cough, and he kept giving me all different forms of antibiotics. And he wasn't doing any good at all. Okay. So, what happened after you went to the doctors? After I went to the doctors, I kept going there and he kept giving me all different types of antibiotics, like saying, what did I give you the last time? And he kept referring to his book, okay, I'm going to try you on this one, take these. And soon nothing was happening to cure the cough or anything. So therefore, I went to a walk-in clinic mm -hmm. and I asked them for some tests, you know, of my urine and things like that. And they done a test on my urine and they wasn't 100% sure whether I had a protein leak or whether it was contamination from my underwear. This is how the doctor prescribed it to me. He goes, we're not 100% sure at this precise moment. But if you were to come back the following week and do another test, it'd be in your own interest so that we can get to the bottom of it, whether you've got protein or whether it's just one of those areas where a bit of cotton wool has got into your urine, which is called contamination. Contamination, should I say, rather. So therefore, I came back the following week and I told the nurse that I was advised by the doctor the following week. Or should I say the week before, I was advised from the doctor to take another urine test of my next attendance, just to cover me, to be sure that I didn't have any protein leak or anything. So when I went there, I explained to the nurse. She says to me that he'd been to the big lab, the last urine test, and it's come back okay, that everything's all right, and that I shouldn't worry about this. So I was so persistent because I remember what the doctor told me the previous week and how he explained it to me, that I, I weren't leaving without having this test. I was determined to have this test out of my own interest and to how he spoke to me. So apparently she says, if you want the test, we'll give you another test, but you're okay. So anyway, she says, if you like to do a test, you can do it in this little bottle what she gave me. And she says, she can do the test and leave it in the cubicle. She said, I can leave it in the cubicle, which I did. And I sat outside and I was waiting, 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 waiting. I see people coming, going, coming, going. So I was inquisitive to know what happened to my test. So I got up and I asked one of the nurses there, what actually has happened to my test? Am I okay or am I not okay? And then she says, I'll have a word with the nurse who dealt with you. So she dealt, she called the nurse who dealt with me. They had their little chat. Whatever. And the nurse who dealt with me came straight over to me and she said, Sorry, Mr. Agbigar, we've thrown away your urine by mistake. So I asked her, I says, Well, I need to do another test. There's plenty of water there, mm. you know, because they normally have water and cups there, so I can drink some more water and wait a little while and do another urine test. She said, Oh, no, 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 I don't see where the problem is because you took a test, it's been to the big lab. Mm -hmm. You're okay. There's no problem. I'm telling you, you're okay. So even though I wasn't really 100% convinced, but she convinced me by looking on paperwork that he had been to the big lab and it's come back okay. Yes. So therefore, that convinced me, oh, it's on paper that I'm okay. I must be okay. Mm. Maybe I'm causing a fuss for nothing. So I went away thinking I was okay. 18 months down the line, 
I was in okay because it had been leaking, leaking, leaking. So after the nurse had uh, thrown away the urine sample, what happened from that point onwards? I went home and I had a good feeling within myself, thinking that I was okay, I got the all clear. Because at first, when the doctor told me about I could have a possibility of a protein leak in one of my kidneys, uh, because I, I'm a, what can I say, I don't drink, I don't smoke, and I, I'm one of, I was a health freak at one stage, always active in the gym. I was glad that got out of the way, that I was okay, so I, con so I can continue going to my gym, not having worries about my kidneys leaking, because I've never been in hospital in my life, you know, so it came as a big shock. So I went home thinking that I was okay, thinking that, oh, thank God for that, I'm all right. And I'll just continue living my life, thinking as a normal person, but all the time my kidneys were leaking. Yeah, and then just by chance, because I still had that cough, and they sent me for a chest x-ray, by chance the doctor demanded a urine test at the chest x-ray mm. department. And when I took the urine test there, that's when they discovered I was protein plus, 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 plus. Because it had been leaking for 18 months. 18 months? Yeah, it had been leaking, the kidney. And I was very disappointed when they told me the news. And... How did it make you feel about the actual nurse herself? It just made me think that made me think really bitter towards her at the time but I'm, you know I'm not bitter now because accidents do happen but these accidents what I find out in life they're still continuing you know mm. with my health so I'm very bitter really towards the national health to tell you the truth because I, I'm in this situation now I can't go to do the work what I'm qualified to do like roofing and certain jobs like because of my physical end I can't carry you know, certain objects which, see, my physical I can't carry certain uh, object, of objects really because of my fiscular, you know, so the work what I studied for like roofing, painting and decorating and things like that, I can't do anymore, you know, and training kids in the football ground and things like that, you know, because I've also developed diabetes because of this, because of induced, like, the medication which they gave to me, it induced diabetes on me. So that makes you very tired and restless, it makes you feel very drained out half the time, you know? You, you just, just live in each day as it comes, really, you know? The things you would like to do, you can't do sometimes, you know, because it makes you restless, you know? You know, the kidneys ain't in full function, operating in the right way, and the diabetes is sinking in, and so forth like that, you know? So, that's it really, you know? Okay. You gotta put your other arm up as well, to show the difference between the mm. two. So, essentially, well, at first, we thought that, for, by looking at them, you'd think that they'd be tumours. Mm. But those are your actual veins. Yeah. And what's actually happened to you? Yeah. Because they built some. They said they built something down here, like a fiscula. A fiscula. So each time they're going in, yeah, it's getting bigger and bigger. Oh. I don't know how big it will reach before I have to start thinking seriously what's going to happen. Because compared to your other arm, as you can see, it's it's it's, it's not the same at all. Let all. me put it this direction so you can see how big it really is. Uh, and all my hand all scarred up. And that's because they're injecting in the same place constantly. Yeah. Did they say that? They tried to go elsewhere. Yeah. You know, like anywhere here, here, here. But this is still happening, you know? Yeah. Because. You know, 
I don't even think the pictures do it justice or video does it justice to actually see it and then in comparison to your other arm. The thing that I put in on my arm all the while. Look. Look. You see? If we time, boom, right up here. Look. Boom. And they pick different holes each time? Yeah. Oh. But look, all this has been hole. Look, it's my, my, my skin is thinning. Look. So is that a vein? Yeah, that's that's a thing like. So it's the it's form. Like, yeah, it's deformed like that. It's it's formed like that. Yeah. Because of all of the. Yeah, the pricking and so it comes in and probably clot it up. Look. Fuck. You know, and this is all twisted. My arm here is twisted up. You know. You know. Jesus, it's so big. You know, when the blood got through that. You know you're in for a session, four hours. You yeah. know, the blood comes through there, fill this. That's when they clip it. They unclip it. You know when it's in to let the blood flow through here. Mm. Yeah. That's my life man. You know? That's my life. How I have to live. And I'm not too happy. Victor receives dialysis treatment. Dialysis is essentially the filtering and cleaning of the blood with the use of a machine because the kidneys are no longer able to do so effectively. Around a pint of blood is taken out every minute, pumped through the machine, filtered and then pumped back into the patient. To do so, he had to prepare himself by either having a catheter fitted inside him or by allowing one of the surgeons to create a fistula in his arm by joining a vein and an artery together. He had both done. He had the catheter fitted when he was on home dialysis. After some months, he discovered uh, a patient had unfortunately died by using this method and out of fear, he opted to switch to hospital dialysis. When removing the catheter so that he would be able to get the fistula done, part of it had broken off and stayed in his body. Till this day, Victor believes that he suffers discomfort and infections from the broken piece of the catheter. You know, sometimes you feel like a break away somewhere, like a week away to get it all off your head. You can't go because you have to keep ringing air, finding out whether they'll accept you or oh, what's going on, how much you have to pay out there extra. Because each dialysis session out there is about 250, 300 pounds each session out there. If it's not in Europe, you know that? You know what I mean? So all them places like where I dreamt of going, you know? I can't go no more, not for now anyway. It's slowing me right down, you know? You know what I mean? Slowing me right down. Certain things what I used to do for enjoyment, I can't do anymore, you know? Mm. I can't do it no more. If I jog around the block out there, I'm getting pain all in my back, which I never used to get before, you know? I used to go jogging six o'clock in the morning before I go to work. I can't do that no more. I tried it. Both my back, my legs cramping up on me. You know, all that medication there got all side effects to them, you know that? It's dehydrating. Yeah, they're making me ring, my ears are ringing. Sometimes I think a car's coming and it's not even coming, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think the car's coming, yeah, boom, boom, yeah. And when I look, nothing's there. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm laughing now, but it's not funny, mm -hmm. you know? I went for a jog, when was it? About a week ago, yeah? And I was out of breath, you know? And I'm running, yeah? 
and I hear noises like cars are coming after me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I said, bloody hell, I better get home quick. Oh. My ears were ringing. You know, it's, it's, it's a horrible life. Horrible, man. I'm thinking what I must do, man. I can't do nothing, man. What can I do? You know? What can I do? All they said to me, sorry, we make sure it won't happen to anybody else. Oh, what can I do? You know? Every time I go into a hospital there, my heart beats like a terrorist. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, you know? A terrorist. Yeah, my heart beats like a terrorist. I think to myself, what am I going to do? What can I do? You know? Am I going to let them finish me off or what? Or are they going to take me serious <laughs> and start looking about my health? You know? I walk through the swing doors, yeah? And I'm thinking, I remember when I first walked through here. Yeah? It was my first time going into a hospital looking about a hospital. I'd never seen a hospital in my life. I wasn't even born in hospital. And I went through there and I see, like, because it's quite clean, the hospital. And I went through there and I said to myself, oh, I'm in good hands here. The place is clean, clean, clean. After a while I start going there, going there and I've seen how reckless and careless they are, you know? How they're performing. Sending me a home for six months, come back six months time. And not dealing with me, not dealing with the problem, you know what I mean? They found out that I had a kidney leak. They didn't deal with me till three months after that. Even when they found out the kidney was there after waiting 18 months for them to discover what was wrong. You know, they sent me home and said I'm okay. So all these little things here, you know. All these little things, you know. And anything they tell me, I don't believe them anyway because that... Since they put me down having a transplant on there already, which I didn't have. From that day there, I think something's going on a conspiracy true i had solicitors on them before i don't think they're looking out for my welfare yeah i'm telling you the truth i don't think they're looking at yeah because i just find it amazing how they can tell me i had a heart attack yeah and i didn't have no heart attack and then when the letter come through they're saying uh, and block vessels here, done this. And it ain't even the hospital would check me out, was giving me the outcome. Mm. It's not even them. It's just the ones who sent me there. They're just rectifying why they sent me there. Oh, we sent him there. This is what's wrong with him. We put this down. But when you got down. there to the actual chest? When they put this, like, the die up me, they said, nothing's wrong with your chest. Your chest is all right. You haven't had no heart attack. I don't know what the fuss is about. But these people tend to think that, oh, they unblocked this vessel, they done this and that. They ain't done nothing to me. It's just to cover up their errors, or their pure blunders, you know? Blunders and errors. This is what they're doing to some people, you know? And when I went down there, because I'm a quiet patient, really, yeah? When they asked me if I wanted to do the experiment, because they know I'm new to the game, you see? Mm. So they asked me if I wanted to do that experiment with the chest and I told them no. So for them to get me to do it, two months down the line, they said I had a heart attack. When I went down there now, I sat amongst all the other patients down there. Some of them looking limbo, some of them staring up at the ceiling. Some of them don't know why they're there. One geezer said he had it done five times. I said, why do you have it done five times for? And one sufficient or twice. He said, oh, they just keep calling me. So they tried to put me in that bracket, you know, guinea pig bracket, so that we've got some recruits here. We're going to work on them and find out how the experiment goes. You see, this is what I'm frightened of as well. Because if they do give me a kidney, yeah, obviously they got these new... Thing. up and coming doctors yeah who wants to try to find out you know everybody's got to do their first operation yeah but i don't want them to do that with me because i've had that in the past when they was plunging my back for biopsy and all that you know 
they had the trainees doing it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know nothing about it that time. That's how they caught me off guard. So when they keep plunging me, plunging me, my kidney was deteriorating more. Because they're putting holes in it, you know? But at that time, I didn't know that they were trainees. It's only when I hear them saying, little bit to the left, little bit to the right, plunge, you know? And then after he goes, one more time, if we don't get it this time, we call the professional doctor to come. So I thought to myself, wait a minute, so you thought professional? He goes, no, these are the trainees, we're just trying them. So I said, why are you doing it with me for? You know? So anyway, they got somebody else to do it in the end. And that was it, because they kept plunging that muscle tissue instead of the kidney, kidney. you know? And they start talking crap. Oh, uh, did you work on a building site? Because it's hard to get through to the back. So I said, no. They said, ah, oh, because uh, we're digging deep, but we can't get down. Anyway, we have one more go. If we can't get it this time, we're called the professionals. I jumped up. I said, what do you mean professional? So you're not professional and you're playing about. But I was stupid because when my friends was telling me, don't go there, let them plunge you up here. I should have listened to them. You know what I mean? But I thought I was in good hands. I thought, well... You know, you can't listen to your mates, listen to the professionals, you know, because I thought they were professional, yeah? I know there's some in there professional what do their job right, like the diabetes doctor what attended to me and he had time for me and found the right tablet to give me and the insulin. But other than that, I haven't had no joy along the way. It hasn't been an easy ride for me. Anytime they tell me something's wrong with me, yeah, I take it lightly. I don't like think, ah, because they said this is wrong with me, that I'm going to believe them. I don't have no faith in them anymore. When they said I had a heart attack, I didn't have a heart attack. What, well, you meant to believe them? Yeah, how can I believe them? And they got me down on the computer here yeah, saying that I've had a kidney transplant. How do I believe them? You know, I don't even trust them. I'm going into theatre, they got somebody else's name on my wrist. I'm going to theatre. The person's name, what they had on there, I can't remember his name, Mr. Adams or whoever. Suppose now, he was going there to get his leg Amputation taken off. Amputation. Amputation. Yeah, they would have took my leg off. Because they don't check, they just say, oh, right knee above here. And they have their little names, what they call, and their little tools to take it off, sores and everything. And they would have took my leg off. Because that's how they are, careless. And then after, oh, you hear on the news, ah. Oh, Man had his leg amputated by mistake, <laughs> by mistake. <laughs> you know, it's so funny, you know, by mistake, they say. So what do I do? I'm still in the same boat, you know? You got no wristband on him? No, nothing. The name on the wall isn't his. You know? If something was to go wrong, how could they identify him and deal with the issue? You know, the public need to know and be aware of these Errors and blunders what are going on in the National Health Service.